Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, this is John McDougall. I am the event coordinator here at Murder by the Book in Houston. And before I bring out our authors tonight, I just make some quick store announcement stuff, let you guys know what's going on with us at the store. Um, if you have not come to visit us in a while, we are open. Um, so we hope that you will come check us out. We have not had an in-store event since March of 2020. But uh, on Saturday, November 27th, which is Small Business Saturday, we're going to be doing two Murder by the Book recommends events in store. We're going to be doing one at 11 o'clock and one at one o'clock. If you're not familiar with those, if you're local, what the Murder by the Book recommends events are is it's essentially the staff sharing some of our favorite uh, reads. We're going to be recapping some of our favorite reads for the year, giving you some good holiday ideas um, for gifts, things like that. So we hope that you will come check that out. As far as author events, um, tomorrow, or not tomorrow, on Friday night, uh, Kathleen Kent and Hank Phillippe Ryan are going to be uh, chatting with us, and then we'll take a little bit of a break next week for Thanksgiving. And then um, on the 30th, we're going to have a, a pre-recorded event with Harlan Coben in conversation with Patricia Cornwell, which we're super excited about. Uh, and we will be finishing out the rest of uh, 2021 with virtual events, but we're really excited. We're starting to hear from some publishers and authors about getting people back in the store. So we have um, a nice roster of people that we've got scheduled for in-store events in January. Uh, so far, we've got James Rollins, Alifair Burke, Brad Taylor, uh, and Nick Petrie all confirmed. So uh, when you check out the event calendar uh, for January and February, you will see the events will either be listed as in-store or virtual. For the moment, we're not going to be live streaming the in-store stuff. We want to kind of just be able to get to enjoy being in the store surrounded by readers in a way that we haven't been in a while, but we are looking at ways to be able to live stream some of that stuff. Uh, so I'm going to get us started tonight with our authors, but while they are chatting this evening, if you have questions for them about writing process, previous books, any of that stuff, please post those either in the live chat on YouTube or the comments on Facebook, and we will get to them after they've had time to talk. So first up, I'm going to bring out my Mark Cameron. How are you tonight, Mark? Really good. Thanks. Glad to be here. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, so Mark's newest book is Tom Clancy Chain of Command, which just came out on Tuesday, which was yesterday. Uh, so a native of Texas, Mark Cameron spent almost 30 years in law enforcement. He served as a uniformed police officer, mounted horse patrol officer, SWAT officer, and a U.S. Marshal. He is conversant in Japanese and travels extensively researching his New York Times bestselling Jericho Quinn novels. Uh, his books have been nominated for both the Barry and the Thriller Award. Next up, I'm going to bring out Brian Andrews. How are you tonight, Brian? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us this evening. So uh, Brian and Jeffrey Wilson have co-written uh, WBE Griffin Rogue Asset, which actually comes out in uh, December. It comes out on December 7th. So if you guys want to pre-order it, you are able to do that. I'll drop a link uh, to the website with the uh, buy links in just a little bit. Uh, but Brian Andrews is a U.S. Navy veteran, park leadership fellow, and a former submarine officer with a psychology degree from Vanderbilt and a master's in business from Cornell University. And I'm going to bring out Jeff Wilson. How are you tonight, Jeff? I'm doing great, John. Thanks for having us. Thanks for joining us. So Jeffrey Wilson has worked as an actor, firefighter, paramedic, jet pilot, and driving instructor, as well as a vascular and trauma surgeon. He served in the U.S. Navy for 14 years and made multiple deployments as a combat surgeon with an East Coast-based SEAL team. He and his wife, Wendy, live in Southwest Florida with their four children. So um, as I mentioned, their book, um, which is called Rogue Asset, is going to be out on December 7th. And Mark's book, uh, Chain of Command, has just come out on Tuesday. And like I said, while they're chatting, if you guys have questions for them, please feel free to post those in the chat and we'll get to them in a bit. But for now, I'm going to turn it over to you all and let you chat. And I will see you in just a little bit. Awesome. Thanks, John. Mark, I got to be honest, I tried to talk Wendy into coming because she speaks fluent Japanese, and I thought it would be great if we did the whole thing in Japanese, but oh, I was yeah. shocked by both John and Wendy, so that's <laughs> even like that. You should well, have told her that it was going to be a fireside chat because that would have had that extra appeal. Yeah, uh, exactly. I don't know. I don't know. It's, she would never go to Alaska with her Reno syndrome. It's too cold for her. How are you doing? <laughs> well, yeah. how's, it, how's it having another Ryan book out, man? That's exciting. That's good. That's good. These are always fun. It's it's as as you guys know as much as you write. When when that baby's born, you're already planning the next baby and working on the one before that. So people ask me questions about this one. I'm like, no, no, no that's not. Oh yeah, I guess it is about that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that. 
yeah, I'm in DE. I can't talk about that. Right? <laughs> exactly. I got to, I got to ask, you know, I'm part of this is selfish. You know, we're doing an estate thing now with uh, the web grip and stuff. Um, but I got to say, I'm so impressed that you have the hardest estate writing job, I think in the world. Brian and I were talking about this offline. You're still writing the legacy Ryan, you know what I'm saying? Like the president Jack Ryan and all the things that have come before. I think, you know, no, nothing against Don Bentley, great friend and phenomenal writer, but I oh, yeah. got to think writing Jack Ryan jr. There's a freedom there, right? You're totally <laughs> by anything in the past, but how on earth do you keep going with Jack Ryan and still find incredible storylines? Like, you know, Kathy is getting kidnapped now and the, you know, the fate of the world and, it's just incredible to me that you keep it fresh like that. That's got to be very stressful when you're writing a legacy series like that. Well, I, I appreciate that. I, somewhere on my social media, there's a photo of, um, well, there's two photos back in October of, of 2016 when my agent called. We were, my wife and I were down in Florida um, near Port Charlotte doing some research for one of my other series, the Arliss Cutter series. And I, uh, I'd been swimming and, you know, you know, research stuff, looking for sales and things like that. And, uh, the phone rang and she was kind of laying out on the beach and I would had my, for some reason I had my phone with me and, um, I answered the phone and I guess she thought that somebody had died for whatever reason. She took a picture of me and I am, I have this goofy looking hat on and it's sort of a, old looking Hawaiian shirt and I've got my phone in my ear and I'm kind of clutching myself looking like I'm about to have a heart attack. And it was my agent calling and saying, Mark Graney recommended you for this gig and Tom Colgan with Putnam called and I'd like you to write the next Tom Clancy, Jack Ryan. And I just thought of every reason in the world why I couldn't. Well, I owe Kensington this next book. I got to do this. And, and she, in, in her great, my agent's just Robin Rue with Writer's House. She's such a great lady. And she just said, Mark, don't screw around. It's Clancy. And I, I said, <laughs> okay, all right, all right, all right. But then the follow-up picture is me collapsed on the sand. And, and it was not staged. My wife was just kind of following <laughs> me around going, what's happened? What's happened? And, um, yeah, it, it was, a, it, you know, and I, I told Tom Colgan later, had the person that got that gig not been terrified it was probably the wrong person for one thing you don't just have to i didn't just have to take over tom clancy's characters i had to try to fill mark graney shoes and yeah so i got double hate i got double hate from people <laughs> clancy's dead there's no way you can do that and we miss mark so you're not mark graney so you suck <laughs> well they're they're great man i i love them it's just but I, I, I get what you're saying. It really resonates with me, this idea of a tremendous responsibility, right? Like when we write our own stuff, like I, I'm, a, I'm a huge Arliss Cutter fan. I'll just tell you that oh, right man. now. Uh, I, love, I love the Cutter series. Um, I'm, I, want, I hope and there's another one coming out next April. But um, there's a weight that is on you. Like you're excited. And I, so the whole, the whole picture, I know Brian is thinking the same thing, that whole picture of excitement and then collapsing on the beach, like, that's how we felt when we had our first conversation with Tom about, you know, taking over something like it's such a responsibility. You feel a, a weight of responsibility to this author that you adore and all that he's built and to the readers. And then in your case, Grainy, for sure. I mean, yeah, it's it's something it's. Uh, well, you guys, did they did they how, when you have a team, how do they approach a team for something like that? Do they get you both on the line together or do they say, hey, Jeff, go convince Brian to do this or vice versa. Or how, how does that work? I mean, they call Brian. I do, I do whatever he says. They know that. <laughs> well, it's easy. Our, our joke is between the two of us, there's one good writer. So it really doesn't matter. <laughs> we are a package deal. So if you want one, you get the other. So uh, that, that's the wow. easy part about Andrew and Wilson, right? Yeah. yeah. But I think that, you know, we went through some of the same machinations probably that you did, you know, which is, man, can we really live up to, you know, the fans' expectations? And that was one of the first things that we, we sat, when we, we had to sit down with Tom and, and we said, you know, I don't know if we can write like Webb Griffin. He said, stop, don't, 
even try. I don't want you to write like Webb Griffin. Mm -hmm. I want you guys to write like Andrews and Wilson, but tell a Webb Griffin story. And so for us, right. that was very powerful advice. And, um, and, and that, those were our marching orders. And that's, that's sort of the guiding ethos for us on that first book. I'm glad to hear you say that. I, I got a, I already have a contract, so this is not trying to kiss up to Tom, but uh, he just has this way of of dealing with writers like us. In this, you know, he's got several in his quote unquote stable, if you will, that are that are writing for for legacy kind of characters and authors, and he's got a way of sort of cajoling us along and making sure that we because he's familiar with all these and. Many times he'll say, well, you can't do that with a Jack Ryan character. And I'll say, okay. And then other times he'll say, you can't do the Jack Ryan character. And I'll say, well, Clancy did it in this book and this book and this book. And he'll say, okay. And he, there's no, <laughs> there's no ego there. We, we really are able to bounce stuff back and forth, but he's, he's an expert that I depend on, but he told me the same thing. Don't write, don't try to be Tom Clancy, write a Tom Clancy or write a, Mark Cameron book in the spirit of Tom Clancy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's liberating, isn't it? Like you, all the paralysis goes away once he gives you, Tom's a great guy. We've really loved working with him for sure. But yeah, once oh, you yeah. write your own stuff and just pay homage and honor these characters and these universes that were built by some of the greats, it does take a lot of pressure off. It takes a lot off. I'm still paralyzed in my right <laughs> hand and left foot and all that, but it's still, it's a, <laughs> Yeah, I find that when I write characters that are either that came along a little later that had some room to grow or one of the benefits, um, and I think you guys in, in reading, I don't want to give anything away because your book is not out yet, but you get to take some characters and develop new ones as well. And it, it kind of, it gives you that freedom to uh, do some pretty cool stuff by giving a tip of the hat to an older agent a pre, you know, and then developing your new guy. And that, that was fun. That was, I'm not quite done. I'm like three quarters in, but it's a fun book. Well, oh, thank you very it much. A yeah. A lot. That means a lot coming from you, Mark. I tell you, that was another thing that, you know, I feel, I feel like we might be the, the junior guys because we had it so easy. You know, we had Tom giving us this great advice, but the other thing that was easy for us was the time lapse. Right. So the last mm -hmm. presidential agent book was eight, you know, be almost nine years ago. And um, Tom encouraged us to just build that time lag into the next book. Mm -hmm. And by that was the other great advice for us was that gave us such an opportunity to bring in new characters. And, you know, the whole world has changed. Eight years have gone by. There's a new president. We were able to it's not too much of a spoiler. We were able to bring Natalie Cohen right. in as the president. And right. so we were able to have a lot more flexibility than if it's like, okay, the next book that occurs 90 minutes later, right? That would right. Be like, like Jack Ryan has been the president for, if you have timelines for like 20 something years, <laughs> but, but we, but, but we don't look at time that way in the Jack Ryan senior series. We really, the events could take place minutes apart or, yeah. you know, some of the things over the years people have aged, but since I've started, writing them. Nobody's aging anymore. I just, those poor people are going to get terrible stroke <laughs> things because they, they're just constantly bombarded with, you know, I hope that their stack tolerances are, are higher than mine. Cause they'll be laying like twitchy on the beach pretty soon with everything happening to them. But I, I did like, I like the way I wanted to start. I wanted before we go and I don't get a chance to say it because it seems like these sorts of conversations go by and then the moderator comes back on and then we're done. But early on in my writing career, when I first started writing the Jerichos, I'd written a bunch of Westerns, but early on uh, with my Jericho uh, Quinn work, my editor got me aside and I had written a little beginning chapter where I was trying, I think it was my second one. My first one started, you know, really fast, blah, 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 all the big motorcycle chase and all that. And the second one, I tried to wax a little philosophical and be writerly and, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. And uh, he gave me really the best piece of advice. And I think you guys really ticked the box to start with a massacre and build from that. <laughs> and, and I think uh, I think you did it. I really think you did. It certainly terrified me. I have one 
form of inf- intent, enhanced interrogation that scares me or they're worse than any other. And, and did you we guys, nail it? And you guys <laughs> nailed it. I I had to I had to quit reading. It was <laughs> it was visceral. It's that. And uh, readers are gonna, you know, we ought to we ought to freak them out. And you guys freak me out for sure. Yeah, as a submarine guy, you know, claustrophobia is not a problem for me. So I don't mind torturing readers and other people with claustrophobic. You know, there's claustrophobia and there's claustrophobia. And I mean, I I had a fairly domineering father. And I remember I was probably 11. No, not even that much. Nine living in Texas. And we had a culvert under our driveway, as many people do. And it had kind of grown up. And we were mowing the lawn and fixing, and he had fixed, a, got cut a bunch of the grass, and something was blocking the middle of the culvert. And he said, "I need you to climb in there and, and clear that out." And <laughs> at nine years old, and my dad still used a belt, and you know, you did what he said. I just said, "Are you out of your mind? <laughs> There's no way I'm crawling in in that thing." And luckily, he didn't uh, didn't smack me around, but. Uh, there, yeah, claustrophobia. There, I could be on a submarine. I can't do it. You guys have done. Good job. Anyway, very oh, thanks. Very. Uh, what What did Robert Frost say? No, no tears in the writer. No tears in the reader. I, I uh, certainly felt that with your scene. Many, many of the scenes. You never know, right? So that that's part of this whole thing. Is you know we still have that that nervous energy, right? We're waiting for this thing to get out there and, and what, hear what people say. And, you know, I think in this group, in this group here, it's okay to maybe say, you know, it's hard to compete with nostalgia, right? Like you remember the Ludlums and the Clancy's and you remember them being the, these Hallmark books and they moved you and stuff, but, and so do the readers. And so it's hard to compete with, uh, with that nostalgia, even if you turn out your best product ever. No, you're right. And, and actually, that brings up something that I was talking to Don Bentley about. I have a belief, this is just the, the gospel according to Mark, um, I have a belief that Griffith, Clancy, Ludlam, they were such great writers that had they been writing today, they wouldn't write the same book. The mm-hmm. readers are different, and they were savvy enough to know. For instance, Tom Clancy and Without Remorse spends a page and a half describing a k-bar knife readers would not put up with that now they would we have wikipedia now most of the readership probably has a k-bar knife in their, (laughs) you know in their or their spouse does or whatever so it's uh it's a so what our job all of us don me our job is to write that legacy universe and make the reader feel like they felt when they read the original yeah. books, not copy what they said, but somehow tap into that same tap into today's zeitgeist, but give them that same sense of awe that Tom Clancy could give them from writing about a Wartzilla engine or, you know, a, a major, you know, <laughs> description of the propulsion system of a submarine without doing quite as much you know, and doing it in a, in a, in a world where so many readers, no, I shouldn't say readers, so many people, um, don't know, don't real aren't familiar with what a five paragraph essay is, or that we're more interested in games and, you know, pretty immediate gratification on the page. We have to somehow figure out how to make them feel like we felt. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's I think that's brilliant. That's exactly right. We've had that conversation a few times about, you know, if we the vice is true as well. Right. If you were to take a tier one book back in time to 1977, they they would be like, no, no, it's like this. is So the readers definitely, definitely have changed. They want they want a different type of pace. They want a little more action. They're not going to tolerate, you know, 127 pages and then a half a page of action anymore. Um, right. and, and I am that reader, you know, I'm, I'm 50 something oh, yeah. now. And I grew up reading those books and loved them. And then you go back to them now and you're yeah. like, I still love them. I love the nostalgia, but where's all the, you know what I mean? So yeah, you got oh, yeah. 
do. It well, can't just I, be. No, you're right. You're absolutely right. Just look at the way uh, Forsyth has changed his books. And you can go back and read The Dogs of War and then read, I don't know, it's still a little bit older, but The Afghan or something like that. And it's a different way of writing. He figured out, you know, what how to change things. I, The Dogs of War was one of my favorite books. When you go back and reread it, it's kind of a, a shopping list and Google list of, you know, how to put together a, a coup. Um, still a very interesting book for me, but it's a little harder to get through for newer readers. I, I, I sometimes I'll sit with a stopwatch and I will time the scenes in some, you know, in a streaming show or a movie and see how long it takes, how long each scene is on camera. Sometimes just the, the take, you know, the individual within a scene and other times point of view scenes, very rarely is there a scene on a crime show or, you know, let's say Bosch. Uh, very rarely is there is a scene that's longer than 90 seconds. It's just yeah. not. And, and the different angles and stuff within that scene are five seconds, four seconds. Um, so somehow we have to tap into that with our, I was talking to a lady that's uh, on, a, that works. She's a, Pres, uh, vice president of a big gaming company and she talks about the compulsion uh, like a games you play on your phone she talks about the compulsion loop and how they work very hard to compel the player to continue to go to the next page to continue to as we do you want people to change you know turn the page um and she was very frank with me she said i don't and she's got kids she said as designers, we don't want kids to go out and play soccer. We want them totally nose in the game. Mm -hmm. Like, wow. Yeah, that's, that's a little scary. Horrible. <laughs> it's very I scary. I want to ask you about the flip side of that, too, because um, one of the things that Brian and I were talking about with a friend of ours not too long ago was how, ex not as writers, but as readers, it's a really exciting time to be a thriller reader. Uh, and I know we're all, we're all big readers, all of us that write. Um, and one of the things that's so exciting about it is, I mean, look at this group here. You were a U.S. Marshal for forever. I mean, you were out there doing the job. You write this Arliss Cutter. You write from a, a position of authority. You know, Don was an Apache pilot, an FBI agent. Brian, a submarine officer. I deployed with the SEALs. We have Josh Hood, who was a, you know, airborne ranger and a SWAT sniper. There's mm -hmm. so much life experience being written into thrillers now. And in some ways, it makes me admire the Clancy and the Ludlum and all that even more that they were able to capture some of that realism right. without having been in that suck themselves. Yeah. Do you, you see that too in, in our genre more broadly, this sort of infusion of new life experience that is growing the genre. I do. I, I, I really do. And I'm, it's, I think it's good and it's bad. I think we need to, those of us, and I'm glad you mentioned the, all the authors you did because I really like them, <laughs> but I think it's a disservice to readers. There are some people and I get, and I'm sure you guys get manuscripts as well. I get manuscripts all the time from people. Well, I was a so-and-so here's my manuscript. And that's not enough. I enjoy reading former operators and, you know, former LAPD, former whatever. I enjoy reading those people when they, they care about the craft. When they are, when they sit down at the, at the typewriter or pen and paper or computer or whatever, they're a writer first, and they are a former surgeon second or former submariner second, because there's just a lot of, of storytelling. And, and sometimes, though, in fact, I think most of the time, I think that what I'm talking about is fairly uncommon. Um, there's a certain sort of swaggery storytelling that just goes with these jobs. You know, <laughs> the cops are and um, I haven't been around too many submariners, but a lot of military <laughs> folks. And um, my, I mean, I've got a, a, my youngest son is a SWAT uh, operator and sniper here in Anchorage and uh, was a patrol officer for a number of years. And my oldest son is an ophthalmologist. He's in his last couple of years of residency right now. Uh, but he was an OSI agent for a number of years with the air force and, um, my youngest son was telling me not long ago that the whole reason he got into law enforcement 
was because dinner, sitting around, set my stories that I told at the dinner table and not because he wanted, you know, the daring do and all that. It just, <laughs> he wanted those kind of friends that were his, you know, buddies. And, and it's fun to watch my 31 year old kid now kind of reliving all the stuff that the same kind of stuff that I did. Although, although he, he told me the other day, he was telling me something and it was really basic. And I said, son, I was on a SWAT team. And he goes, yeah, but not a modern SWAT team. And said, Ouch. So now, so now he sends me little gifts of like speed loaders and, you know, AR-15s with a carry handle and, you know, stuff like that and triangular pour ins and, you know, old stuff to date me. We're, we're close. We're like this, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a, a that's that's a good point. Not everyone that has a story to tell can write it down, and you do have to spend some time developing the craft. Um, but coming from professions that are storytellers, you know, Brian, that's how that's how you came into this, right? You were I was always a writer, Mark. I grew up writing short mm -hmm. stories when I was like nine, ten, a lot mm -hmm. like you. But um, but Brian, yours was different, right? Like you were a storyteller, but not a writer. Yeah, I yeah. No, we, we always talk about, Jeff and I like to joke that in the military, especially the types of things that we were doing, you know, there's these long periods of boredom, you know, punctuated by moments of abject terror, right? Where yeah. everything's yeah. going yeah. wrong, yeah. alarms are going off and people are screaming and stuff. But um, during those long periods of boredom, you know, I think it's the humanity. It's, it's our ability to communicate and especially telling stories that helps keep everybody sane, you know, especially if you're in the engine room on a submarine and you got a six hour watch and, you know, you don't change the bell the entire time, you know, mm -hmm. you're going five knots the entire watch and nothing on that reactor control panel <laughs> changes, nothing on that steam plant control panel changes. You're literally just taking logs and till the next hour. So the way that you would pass the time is, is telling stories. And I think I honed my, storytelling skills and maybe even caught the bug for hey you know what this is what defines our humanity this is what makes it us is. people is our ability to share and tell stories and get people thinking about things and um yeah so that's i think like just said, i was a storyteller in the conventional sense uh, or the primitive sense rather first and then got interested in, oh how do i put this on the page and and I want to go back to something you said, Mark, which is, you know, I when I first started, I realized you have that epiphany. I think I don't know what I'm doing. You know, like <laughs> I've read a lot of books, but I don't understand the craft. And that's, you know, that's when I went to ITW and said, I need to I need to learn. You know, I need to go to school for this. And mm -hmm. my school was other thriller writers. And that's oh, yeah. cool, too. Right. So, yeah. No, I think you're you're spot on. The I, I have I like you, I was a, a writer forever, wanted to be, um, and I, but I was also a storyteller and, and sat, I mean, I'm from the South, so I did a lot of sitting on the porch as a little boy, shelling purple whole peas and, you know, <laughs> listening to my aunts tell about who died since the last time we came to see him, <laughs> you know, because um, my mom's from Louisiana, my dad's from Texas, and so we'd go to Louisiana and I'd get chiggers and, you know, um, but, but it was, it was fun for me because I got to hear these storytellers and they knew how to tell a story. That's the way they, they entertain themselves like in a submarine or, or yeah. wherever. Um, and that's the way they, that's the way they taught us through story, you know, telling us about, I, I knew about a Boo Radley character that lived down the road before I ever, read to kill a mockingbird or saw to kill a mockingbird because that's the way they kept us near the house to you know <laughs> tell us about the crazy dude that looked out of the window all the time and um and killed jimmy joe whatever his name was or you know i remember one time i got a tick in my belly button and they they like they, in our family we didn't cut watermelon up we cut it in half and everybody sat around the picnic table and just ate it with a spoon kind of communally and i i made the mistake of showing my uncle that I had this tick in my belly button and they like cleared off the table and I could have used a good surgeon at that time because they were like going over all the ways that you could die from the you know so I, somehow I, I I realized you know these stories are 
they mean something. And then later on as a police officer where you get to see all kinds of for good or bad, you know, good people in their best and people in their worst and terrible human conflict. And I have scars on my ankles from being at church socials and telling stories and watching free actions. And my wife kicking you, sliding her boot down my knee, you know, like these are good people. Stop with that story. These are, these are civilized people. But I knew that if I got if I got that kind of that visceral kind of a look, like for somebody's about to get rid of their three bean salad, that all right, I'm gonna. This is my scene. That's what I'm looking for. I had a really good friend in uh, in college, and he ended up becoming a, a Nashville police officer. And uh, when you were talking, I was thinking of he was a good storyteller and. Just all the different stories that he rattled off, you know, and uh, a lot of them had terrible, <laughs> terrible endings. Oh, yeah. but there were there were laughs along the way <laughs> until you got to the end. And then you're right; it's always that lesson at the end where he's oh, setting yeah. you up, he's setting you up with these laughs. You, you don't think it's going to go there, and it goes there. And you're everybody, you know, you're thinking, I can't believe that happened. And then <laughs> the moral is: so never go down the street. <laughs> all the street lights shot out. At one o'clock in the morning by yourself, you know, <laughs> something no, like that. Exactly. Exactly. I was, I was sitting at a, like a morning um, coffee get together. We, we called them intelligence meetings, but it was a, it was a way for a bunch of agency people to, you know, from different departments and, you know, county, state, feds and all that. And we were sitting around at this little cafe comparing stories saying what we were working on and all that and these were all sort of mid-manager people and um <laughs> i was talking to one of the u.s probation investigators so the the guys that go out and you know they have powers of arrest and all that and uh i saw him kind of perk up and uh i said what is it and he goes listen listen and one of the other guys was telling my war story like <laughs> as if it happened to him he goes and in, in that isn't that yours? And I said, yeah, this is kind of cool. This is he's he's way cooler than I was when it happened to me. He's much more <laughs> intrepid, and um, so we do. You know, it's sort of the the coin of the realm, if you will. I I get to in right, and I'm sure you guys do this too with your past experience, really vast past experience between the two of you. You don't have to rely just on the stuff that happened to you. You're writing That's fiction. Right. So you can, right. you can, I heard about this other thing once that would work really yeah. well here. Right. Oh yeah. There's a I ton know, when I would pull into port, I would circle around with all my buddies on the different subs to get new material before. Oh, we yeah. our next that's, that I'd run out of stories. Oh no, that's smart. I always carry a little, uh, I, I'm probably, it's probably across the room, but I carry a little, either a black wing or a moleskin notebook with me everywhere. My, I've got volumes of them. I, I, I have this, fantasy that my grandkids will fight over them but uh, they'll probably just use them for kindling but they have everything i've sort of learned along the way whether it's about writing or you know how to navigate by the stars when i'm in the south pacific or whatever but i uh, i used to carry it around I still carry them around all the time and i was at a, a meeting and i don't even remember what it was but it was a board meeting in it the department of justice so the marshal service had people there and everybody and they all knew that i wrote i was writing the jericho's quins at the time um just you know part-time in my my flights and all that and so they knew that i wrote they knew that i had this little book and so there was like a a couple of attorneys from doj there was fbi there was a deputy director for the mar or assistant director for the marshal service and they brought in donuts and everything we were kind of taking a little break and then the deputy, the assistant director of the marshal service said, blah, 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 said something funny. And I laughed and he looked at me and I said, that was great. I mean, he's my boss's boss's boss. And uh, he goes, what, what the hell? That was good. Where's your book? <laughs> and I said, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'll write that down. That's a, that's very good, sir. Very good. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. He made the book. He yeah. Made the book. Yeah. Yeah, one, one way or another. <laughs> hey, I was, I was going to ask you guys before I forget. So we get a lot of 
I get a lot of questions when I'm on panels and whatnot about being a plotter or a pantser. Um, I, I, people know whenever they see my writing process, I've got copious notes and I free write. I do a lot of writing with um, Blackwing 602 pencils. I'll wake, I'll, I'll use two notepads at the beginning of the book, just free writing. And then I pretty meticulously plot my scenes and then just fill out. I, I have to know the beginning or the end from the beginning. Um, but then I also like Nick Petrie. He's a big time pantser and he like just, I don't know how he does it, but he's like, ah, I'm going to write some stuff today. And, and it turns out great. Yeah. Um, I, I have a theory that pantsers are just, really, really smart plotters and they just got it all worked out up here already. Um, how, when you're writing as a team, does that work? Are you guys, well, just tell me, how, how does that work? Yeah. So, and it's, it's funny because we sort of fall, fall in the middle. We have to be plotters to some degree, right? Because we, our method, our method of co-writing is that we do write simultaneously. So you know, he's oh, writing, really? he's writing chapter one, two, four, nine, 11. I'm writing the other ones. And we talk four or five, maybe even eight times a day sometimes in the, in the heat of the moment. But so we have to have a little bit of plot, but both of us tend more towards not over outlining. We tend to be more just sort of diving in. Uh, and so we've had to find a little bit of a balance, but your method sounds like so intellectual and sophisticated. Ours is more like two eight year olds in the backyard fighting over who's the, who's the bad guy and who's the good guy with the toy gun. And then, Oh no, 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 here, here's a new rule. Here's a new rule. So our, our plotting method is far from mature. Um, but there is a lot of free writing that goes in. We have to know the end and the beginning and sort of the goal of the chapter we're writing so that the other guy's not wasting his time, but how we fill those details in we do because we used to write separately. Of course we do allow ourselves to still do that, you know, making it up on the fly and, now, if we make a major change, it's immediately to the phone. Brian, just so you know, I don't know what you're working on, but I just changed what Brian <laughs> did completely, dude. And so I love it. I, I think you would have to have that communication. It's a good thing you're friends. I, I always worry Don Bentley's going to send me some letter bomb or something because I'm like, sorry, dude, I cut her arm off in the last book. <laughs> you know, so. Well, there's a lot of trust that goes into it. We are good friends, which means that it could have, this, we were friends beforehand, so writing together could have either made it stronger, which it did. Brian's definitely one of the best friends I've ever had in my life. That's or it awesome. could have completely destroyed a friendship. <laughs> and we had no, no idea going in which way it was going to go, and it definitely could have gone either way. But I think being – you know, you can appreciate this as a federal law enforcement guy or a, even a local law enforcement guy. There's a lot of trust in our communities. you got to trust the guy next to you. There's a lot of mission before self, team before self. And because we both came from that background, I think we were able to just sort of instinctively apply it uh, and, and develop a very rapid level of trust with our, with our teammate in this case uh, writing. So uh, yeah, it's a little schizophrenic. I would hate for anyone to see what it actually looks like. That's a sausage you do not want to see made. I don't think. Well, that's fascinating. It just fascinates me. I don't, do you, I mean, I do a lot of plotting with my wife, but I don't let her read as I go. You guys, by virtue of, I mean, she knows what the book's about. We have lots of pillow plotting and pool plotting and whatever we're doing, plotting, just walking or walk, taking walks. Um, but I don't, but, but it's such a, like you say, the sausage is being made there. And I don't, I don't necessarily want her to critique something that I know is going to change where you guys, you're really laying it all out there. That's a tremendous amount of trust. Yeah. It, it, the flip side of that, though, Mark, is that we wind up with, you know, when you think about what your rough draft looks like as you go into your personal first round of DE before your real editor mm -hmm. does their notes, ours is probably a thousand times cleaner than when I wrote by myself. Just uh -huh. because of it. It's like it's sort of like we're writing the rough draft and developmental editing at the same time, simply because there's two people involved and there's a lot of brainstorming and you know, we're getting editor notes. They're just from the other guy. And so and that's that, cool. that's, it goes a little quicker. And I think it's a little cleaner by the time we hit DE. Do you think that's true, Brian? Or am I just full of shit? What am no, that's our, that's our method. And, and the other thing is, it goes back to sort of what you said earlier, which is, you know, in the, in the military, you know, when you're like on the submarine, 
you know, I can't stay in officer deck 24 hours a day. I got to sleep, you know, which means you got to mm-hmm. hand off to somebody else and feel comfortable enough with their competency that you can actually go to sleep. And I mean, it's, a, it's sort of the same thing here. Like I trust Jeff. He's extremely competent. He's very good at his job. So why would I have any problem like handing off the manuscript or what I've done to him? Because I know it's in good hands. And so that's sort of been our model from the beginning, which is, you know, I'm not afraid to give him my work and he can change it. And he's not afraid to give me his work and we can change it. And so it's kind of like a writer's room almost like our process is Mm -hmm. like a writer's room. It's just every day we're messing around with it and, you know, it's taking shape, taking shape and like a painting, you know, he's Mm -hmm. painting on it it, and I come in the next morning. Oh, look what he did. He painted that (laughs) castle. That's pretty cool. You know, it'd be really cool. So it had a drawbridge, you know, (laughs) you know, so it's sort of that iterative process. And so I think for us, um, we, (laughs) we joke about it sometimes, like we can't wait to see what the other guy came up with on his chapters, you know? And a lot of times the conversation is begins with dude, I never would have thought of that. <laughs> you know? That's good. That, yeah. uh, that's just fascinating. And I never would want to do it. I just, I can't. <laughs> it, it, I didn't uh, want to do it. I said no three times to this idea. But, really? Uh, thank well, goodness I mean, goodness it, it works. It, it works so well. And I, you know, you were talking about um, one of you, I don't know if Brian or Jeff, I think Brian about um, putting ourselves through school. And I, I mean, I, when I read, I generally read with a pencil or a highlighter and I really, I take a lot of notes in the margin and um, just study. I don't have enough time to, it's, it might be pleasurable, but I'm reading for work. Well, you know yeah. how it is. I mean, yeah. we're all trying to get better, right? And when I began Rogue Asset, I began it as a detective thinking, all right, I'm going to figure out. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know which one wrote which chapter, but I'm going to figure out that one wrote this one and one wrote that one. And I can't do it. It is just so fluid. Uh, it, it, very, just incredible. Wow, very that's, good. that's such a compliment. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. That's when we work really hard to do that. But I'll, I'll tell you at what, at some point, I'm not sure when it happened, maybe book six or something. We're, we're 15 books together now or 16 or whatever it is. It is sort of like we have just one brain now. And this <laughs> sounds like something we make up when we have these chats, but there have been times when we're, going through DE and we're like patting ourselves on the back. And I'm like, dude, that chapter, chapter 13, you're at the peak of your game there, bro. And he's like, I don't think I wrote 13. I'm like, damn, <laughs> don't know that hey, damn I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. I, I just wanted to tell you that that's, that's a uh, pretty amazing, pretty amazing. Good job. No, we appreciate it. So, uh, I, th- I think I'd be remiss if I didn't throw some geopolitics in. Uh, yeah, just 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 one question for you. Okay. You know, we're de- we're seeing it every day. It's it's a theme in the in the new book. You know, how robust do you think democracy is? Yeah, that's tough. You know, I think <laughs> I think people are just fatigued. I mean, you, you take it down to more of a. a micro level um or macro level you you take it down to look at the individual look how many people are getting just road rage and they're not on the road they're people on airplanes people at malls everybody's just we're kind it's like society is the end of our rope and there was a time and i I don't want to get in a whoops Sorry, lost you there. There was a time, there was a time when we, and I believe we still can hold ourselves up as the sort of the bastion of, of uh, democracy, but, but I travel a lot. You guys probably travel a lot and I try not to preach to people. I try to listen and there's definitely a, a shift in the way we're looked at. And that's kind of frightening. Yeah. Um, I think we have some introspection to do and to look at and as a nation and as a people, and I will continue to write books where things work out in the end. <laughs> and, and, uh, but there's, you know, I, I don't know. That's a tough question. But I, I do like that you, 
that you don't shy away from that. In this book in particular, it's not heavy handed. There's no it's very politically agnostic, just like we try to be. Um, there's good guys and bad guys, and that's what really matters. But I do think that you used a very gentle brush to find that subtext of distrust that we see in this book in particular. And I, and I liked it. It was, it was exactly enough where no, you know, nobody thinks that you're preaching anything political whatsoever, but there is identifying that, that undercurrent of, of distrust and, you know, right. do votes matter and can, can votes be bought and, you know, can billionaires really decide elections and by just doing nefarious things. And, and mm -hmm. I think you did it in a very good way that will resonate with everybody, no matter which side of the aisle or whatever division you're on everybody can relate to the way you did it. So I, I thought it was masterful the way you approached it. In Me this too. Time. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I, you know, I, I have to admit, you, you mentioned something earlier about how great it is to be a, a thriller reader right now. And you're absolutely true. I probably don't read as much as I should fiction. I, I have lots of friends and I, a lot of times I'll plow through and look at them and see what they're about and, you know, look at character. And like I say, read with a pencil but I read a ton of nonfiction and I just, with the Clancy's particularly, I just have to, yeah. there's no way that I can, for one thing, I really steer clear of, of, well, books like you all's um, when I'm writing a Clancy and I'll, I'll read more crime fiction and then uh, nonfiction. And then when I'm writing a cutter, I'll read more geopolitical stuff and nonfiction. Uh, Cause I'm always, it, it I, it takes a year of reading nonfiction stuff just to maybe just six or seven months to write the Clancy, but a year of study and, and research. But um, so I, I, I think maybe that's something that we as a, a people could do more of is really instead of going with the echo chambers of what that sort mm -hmm. of that things that we already believe and just things that just sort of, help us confirm our own biases to to look at the other side and to to really you know I, i'm reading a book that a, a special forces colonel sent me uh now called special forces berlin and just uh, finished reading a little bit before that reading the rise and fall of the third reich and things like that that are that are pretty timely and and uh scarily timely and um I think that would be behoove us all as as citizens and thriller writer or writers in general. I I read pretty much everything Eric Larson writes because I love writers that send me to the dictionary, and I I have to, uh, you know, luckily I can read it on a Kindle and you know press a button and they go ah, that's what that means. I don't know. What that means. <laughs> I think it's you know Jeff and I talk about that. We also feel that part of, yes, we know we're writing fiction and, and there's the bread and circus element, but at the same time, we do feel like, you know, we're writing hero's journey. We're writing about characters that are trying to be better versions of themselves, characters who matter to us, characters that we want to matter to our readers. And so we feel like part of our mission is, you know, we do want to inspire our readers. We want them to be entertained, but we also want them to walk away from the book and say, yeah, they didn't preach to me, but that's a good dude. And I like the way he handled that situation. Yeah. And he had a compass. And and we, we just hope maybe, you know, when we entertain, maybe at the end of the day, we can at least feel good about saying, hey, maybe we did help push that pendulum back towards the middle of civility and moral compass and that sort of thing through our characters. No, I, I think that's exactly what you, we ought to be trying to do. I'm glad to hear you say that. And I get that in your book. I That comes across. I don't feel the the glorification of, of, I don't know, like in, in, in this, in chain of command, for instance, I don't think it's given anything away by, I, and I don't want to make this sound like I get too navel gazy in it. I hope I don't, but the, but there is a bad group of people called the Camarilla and then there's the campus and the bad, you know, bad group of people that are doing bad things but really, they're just a mirror. They're, if you were to look at their descriptions on paper, the campus and the Camarilla are the same. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to spend too much time think, you know, explaining that to the reader. I'd rather them see it and say, well, what, what really is the difference? Why? I mean, when you think about it, and I'll, I might get in trouble for saying this, but when you think about it, 
in in um, oh heck, uh, clear and present danger. Jack Ryan went to Congress to rat out a president for setting up something pretty much like the campus, <laughs> and then later on started the campus. But his intent is pure, and so. Yeah. As a writer, I have to be honest with myself and say, okay, how is this different than when we introduced Ding and, and the group that went to South America and all of that for the greater good? Well, you can, there's plenty of reasons. People have to read and see the, the personal petty reasons of the president at the time and why he did it, where Jack Ryan, ha he has a noble purpose. But when you just look at it on paper, and so I like to explore things like that, yeah, but I certainly you certainly can't you can't uh, you still have to give the action and as you said the bread and circus stuff to to entertain. Otherwise, people are not gonna not gonna. That's why Southern preachers are so good because they entertain us at the same time. Yeah, that's right. right. You, you, there's got to be entertainment, but then you've still got to have. I think that I think the difference between those two organizations is. Is is motive and having a moral compass, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and the flip side of that, even in a in a broader geopolitical novel like the tier ones that we write and that kind of thing, we try we try really hard to remind the reader, look, this guy is doing some bad things to us because we're us, but he's a hero in his country. Like, yeah, yeah. from his perspective, we're the bad guys, and, and I right. think that you give a much richer, entertaining reader experience when you do that. But it also does show the you know it can it can paint that picture of a moral compass and how that impacts. I, I love that example. Those two different organizations that on paper are the same. How are they different? They're different because people are not going to waver from the moral compass that they have and others are, and they're going to yeah. take shortcuts and cheat. So that's, exactly. fun. that's really fun. I like that. I like exploring that stuff as a reader and a writer. Uh, and that's something Clancy did very oh, well. Yeah. Yeah. He he really did. Did. Red October. He didn't paint the nefarious, Russians, right? The evil empire mm -hmm. over there. There was the elements of that, of course, but you saw the human side of these guys. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, the the young the the young ser submariners themselves, and the the political officer, the or the doctor, I guess the yeah. you know the political officer can be evil, but the yeah, absolutely. The there's and I think travel. That's one of the things, like Mark Twain said, you know, travel cures prejudice, or you know in much funnier terms than that. But uh, I think that may, that's probably why we get to see other people's perspectives and the way they, the lens with which they view the world and view us and stop being so myopic. And, and, uh, you know, when I was growing up, I thought Texas was the center of the universe and I still love Texas. I'm from Texas and, you know, never say a bad thing about it, except that, you know, we here in Alaska have been pissing off Texans since 1959. You know? <laughs> um, so I, you know, I, I can be happy where I'm at, um, but growth and and travel and meeting folks from Australia, New Zealand, and Japan and Indonesia, and China, and um, well, a good example would be to watch. In fact, I talk about it in the previous book, Shadow of the Dragon. Um, they have this hugely high-grossing film in China called Wolf Warrior. And in Wolf Warrior, we're the bad guys. The Americans are, you know, the bad guys that are in Africa just trying to rape the land and which is, you know, and take away all the resources where they come in and, and uh, save the day. And you could really just switch. You know, <laughs> we, we feel like we know, and I, and I believe we do know that I'm, I'm still American and I, believe, <laughs> and I look at things with, with that lens and, and uh, I certainly see what's happening especially being in the south pacific with what uh the chinese are doing there so but but it's interesting to see their perspective and the rank and file citizens perspective on us and they can certainly be the hero in their own movie absolutely and and do heroic things the, the i spent a lot of time with um with the in the previous book particularly on a submarine with a with a chinese submariner having him do things that were pretty dang heroic um even though he was our adversary you know i think it just makes it richer i love that you do that it's definitely and it, you know what it, those experiences that like you talk about they definitely make you a better writer they make you a better human being 
Yeah, you know, well, you hope. <laughs> my life was sort of the opposite. I, I started the other way, and then and now I don't I don't want to move around as much as I used to. I grew up in Berlin, you know, as a dependent, obviously. Uh, at the height of the Cold War, the wall was up. We were in West <laughs> Berlin. I passed through Checkpoint Charlie. I know what it is to be, you know, a national minority and suffer discrimination. We we didn't live on base. We lived out in the community, and it was hard as a kid. Wow. And yeah. I think I brought that a, a, an appreciation not only of what it is to be American, but also what it is to, you know, be a minority in that setting. And so I think it makes you a broader person, but it definitely is a writer allows you to paint your characters with such oh, yeah. detail that you can't capture if you don't have some of that experience. And then serving in war, you know, having an Afghani interpreter assigned to me and getting to know him and his family. And you see these cultures, you see these people. And in the end, they're you. They just yeah. want to, they want to take care of their families and they want to be safe and they want to run their yeah. business. And, yeah. You know, just eat and, and, feed their families. And I, I was this special forces colonel. I was chatting with him about that exact thing. And I said, how do you, when do you start trusting your, your, you know, your Kandak, your Afghan commando partners? And he said, when they're, when they're jamming to the same music you're jamming to, and when they got a, a skull ring in their back pocket and, you know, <laughs> then, then they've, you know, you guys have meshed, you can, you can get along. And the, it, the people that we, are very close friends with, and in, in uh, I mean the culture that we become close friends in the South Pacific, the Maori culture. They have a saying: it's it's an elder comes to a younger person and says, "What's the most important thing in the world?" And the young person gives some other answer, and the elder says, "Hetangata, hetangata, hetangata." It means it's the people, it's the people, it's the people. And I think whether we write or you write, and one thing that I think, again, you guys really nailed it. You can write about tech. You can write about the geopolitical whatever is going on. You can write about this cool presidential agent, which is really cool, by the way. Um, and you carry that on perfectly. But really, when you write about a, a guy in the situation that terrified me and what happened to him, it's the person that they, all that stuff is happening to that as a reader, that's what that's what's interesting to to us as readers. All right. I'm sorry to pop in and interrupt, but I've got a couple of crowd questions I want to make sure we get yeah. to before we head out for tonight. So first up, Matt wants to know, when you're tasked with carrying on a legacy like Clancy or Griffin, um, are there people that you initially go to to help prep, prepare for that other than Tom Colgan? Like, who do you call when you're trying to figure out how you're going to write in this world? Well, um, I'll just start. I call Mark Graney. <laughs> I don't... Uh, I. <laughs> Honestly, there's enough there are there are enough books out there and there's enough, you know, Tom Clancy IP that I can look at. I steer clear of the movies because they're a different universe. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love the movies, but they're a different universe. People ask me all the time, who do I picture as Jack Ryan? And in my brain, when I'm writing writing Jack Ryan, I'm writing I think of Tim Daly. That's just the the <laughs> picture in my head when he was you know, the husband on Madam Secretary, that really good professorial guy. And that way it keeps me from thinking of only a Harrison Ford yeah. or only, a you know, somebody else. Um, but I look to the books. I look to the books and uh, but but Tom and I have some thoughts and I'll quiz Mark to make sure that I'm not getting the soccer team wrong or the whiskey wrong or whatever. And then just. Uh, Look to the look to that back list. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. That's what we definitely had to spend a lot of time going back through the first eight books in the series, you know, because ours is the ninth book in the installment in here. But I do think Mark Graney was a, a good resource for us. For us, it wasn't about Griffin's universe, but just about, you know, this is our first book writing in an estate deal and and trying to maneuver through what that's going to be like. So he was very valuable, Josh Hood, Don Bentley. Other people uh, who have written within these estate projects were invaluable and, and echoed a lot of the advice that Colgan gave us. Of course, Tom's, yeah. you know, he's a master at this stuff. Um, but it was nice to hear from other writers. Oh, damn, don't make this mistake or don't try hard right. to do this or that. Yeah. So uh, we, we turned to other estate writers for the most part. No, absolutely. All right. 
So uh, Todd has questions for everybody. Uh, so for Mark, he says the addition of uh, the addition of new blood to the campus is a big development in the series. Was that something that came from the Clancy estate, Tom Colgan, or something that you wanted to do? You know, in this particular book, it's it was something I wanted to do. I mean, before Clancy passed away, he you know he had written Teeth of the Tiger, and then far you know I think he co-wrote uh, Dead or Alive, um, and he was introducing new people from you know the campus and all of that, and then Grant Blackwood. Uh, developed some new characters and Mark Graney developed some new characters. And um, so I have just along the way, you, you kind of have to do that. You have to do that to be able to have some arcs to play with that are, are your own um, because let's face it, Jack Ryan's character arc is doing the right thing <laughs> all the time. He's just a good guy and he's been around long enough that there's not a great big, he's not going to have this big, epiphany about life he's jack ryan like bond doesn't have a big epiphany about being james bond um and so introducing new characters is something that i think we have to do and in a book this size for one thing i'm not going to kill off anybody that that they <laughs> that they made oh, we lost somebody we did <laughs> we lost uh we lost jeff, so jeff we'll hopefully he comes back yeah, we'll see if he pops back in. So then, so then, um, Brian, this one's for you. Then, so it was for both of you. But um, the two of you are known for writing some of the best team-oriented series in the game. Is the new team and rogue asset something you set out to develop in the book, or was that the plan from the beginning? It wasn't the plan from the beginning. I mean, I think, like Jess said earlier in this discussion, we have this time gap, and the first thing that we were interested in looking at is, you know, what's happened to Charlie over the last eight years? You know, what is he doing? And where, what is his headspace? And so it was very important for us to focus on Charlie, get the reader back into, hey, this is what Charlie, welcome back. Yeah, what Charlie's, he works now, I guess, sorry. <laughs> this is what Charlie's doing. This is what he's up to. And this is how he's going to respond to, you know, being tugged out of retirement. And we felt like, you know, to, there's such a, there was such a big, rich cast of characters with the Marriott Laws and, and, and such a big universe. We thought to try to bring everybody back in this book would require us to do backstories and everybody and bring everybody up to speed and, and, and we'd lose Charlie. And it almost felt like if we just brought in some new specialists that he didn't know, they'd get mm -hmm. to know, Char you'd get to know Charlie through their eyes, Right. Instead of having to have everything happen through internal monologue or introspection, much more organic if, hey, they're getting to know this guy <laughs> and have an open book and parts of his personality start dribbling out and yeah. it's, it's, it's more fun that way, more organic. Um, so Susan wants to know, she says, not considering your own, but since you guys are writing in properties, I think you could probably pick a property author if you want. Who is your favorite fictional character? Let's start with Mark. Like favorite fictional character of mm -hmm. anyone? Yeah. Oh goodness, and and not in the Clancy world, huh? I mean, I, I I think she says not your own, but I think since you're writing in the Clancy world, I'm going to cheat and say that if you wanted to pick a Clancy character, you could. Well, I I say Mary Pat fully. I I just think she's. I mean, obviously, I enjoy writing John Clark the most, but I think I'd get because I'm. I mean, look at me. I'm an old former action guy. I, uh, but I, I really am looking forward to exploring and readers that have read my Clancy's could kind of see who I am the most interested in because they get increasingly more page time. But yeah, I like, I like uh, Mary Pat out of that group. How about you, Brian? And that's a tough question. I, I honestly, no one's ever asked me that. I don't think I have a particular one favorite character. Um, you know, there's so many, what I like about the richness of this genre is you get all these facets of people, you know? And so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm going to have to punt that one for, for, all right. <laughs> yeah. And I hate to sound, you hate to sound like you're evading a question, but you, you know, you, John Clark, right. As soon as, as soon as Mark said, John Clark, he's like, Oh yeah, it's John Clark. And then he said somebody else and somebody, and, and I agree with all of them. They're all so diverse and so different. Uh, even in our own universe, you know, we write multi POV like a lot of thriller writers do now. And 
you know, after you get into your sixth or seventh book, uh, you love all those people. It'd be like mm -hmm. asking you which is your favorite kid when it comes yeah. to <laughs> when it comes to your own work. But even as a reader, I feel that way a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right, last one before we head out for the evening. So, are there any authors that you still get that you've gotten starstruck, or that you still get starstruck when you meet? Let's go backwards and start with uh, Jeff this time. Oh, Mark Cameron, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> um, I, you know what? In our community, it is so collegial uh, mm -hmm. that even when it was appropriate for me to be starstruck, because I was, you know, just had one book out, or I was unpublished, or whatever I was. I would meet these people at like ITW and Thriller Fest. And it's such a close knit family like community that you might walk into a situation feeling that way and it immediately goes away. And I think anybody that's out there that has never been to a Thriller Fest, you should go to New York in the summer and experience that for yourself and and, and have a cocktail with your favorite writer and realize he's just, you know, that's just a dude. It's just a just a lady. It's just a person like me who loves stories. Uh, and that's what I love the most about writers, to be honest. Yeah. True. How about you, Brian? I mean, I think that I like the ITW point that Jeff made. I remember I met Ken Follett at ITW, and, and he's just a such a cerebral, he, but he, he, clever, so clever. His mind's so quick. And mm -hmm. uh, so he, I, I think I probably was a little starstruck when I first met him. Yeah. And then, you know, Mark Cameron, second, probably. <laughs> That's funny. How about you, Mark? Uh, I would, I would, as far as thriller writers, I'd probably say Ken Follett. He's the person that I, I started taking his books apart, and and he's represented by the same agency I am. So when you walk into Writer's House, I mean, I have the Man from Saint Petersburg completely dissected as if it was a college class, and and the Eye of the Needle, and you know, I just. I really studied the way that he writes, but when you walk into writer's house, there's a painting of him and he's in his, he's in his study and, but a dozen of his characters are kind of around him. Oh, wow. um, just wow. sort of, he's holding court with all these characters and it's, it's just fascinating. But uh, as, as they both said, ITW and, and these conferences we go to, you learn that they're pretty, pretty approachable people at, I think if I got to meet David McCullough, I think I would I would probably be more starstruck than anything, uh, or or Eric Larson. I'm just I'm so in awe of the way he writes that I would I would be scared to speak because I would be trying to use you know big words when I was around him and I'd probably use them wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that is going to do it for us this evening. But to recap, for anyone who might have joined us late, we have been chatting with uh, Mark Cameron, whose newest book, Tom Clancy, Chain of Command, just came out Tuesday. It is the 21st book in the Jack Ryan series. And we've been chatting, chatting with Brian Andrews and Jeffrey Wilson, whose book, um, W.E.B. Griffin's uh, Rogue Asset, which is number nine in the Presidential Agent series, comes out on December 7th. If you um, want to pre-order that one, you can pre-order it from the Murder by the Book website. I've dropped links. We also have copies of Mark's books in stock now. If you missed uh, any part of the chat once we are done, Facebook and YouTube will archive it so you can rewatch. Um, and while you're there, we hope you'll surf around and check out all of the other virtual event stuff that we've been doing for the last uh, couple of years. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us this evening. This was fantastic. Great thank time. you. Hope to see you in person next year. Yeah, definitely. You guys take care. All right. All right. Take care. Thanks.